resume our, our sermon series this week on the environment. We've been talking about that. And again, it's a controversial subject because everyone has their own opinions on the environment. And again, I'm refocusing, I'm bringing all of this back to the book of Mark. And I'd like to read that passage one more time. In the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 16 and 17, they brought the coin and asked them, and he asked them, whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Mark 12, 16 through 17. God, I come before you one last time today, and I ask that you would work in our lives so that we would hear your words. Block the words of Matthew, but may your words speak to us. May your spirit commune with our soul today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so some of the things that we had spoken about is we had said that the earth belongs to God. And that if we were to give what God what is God's, we are to honor God's creation. We also said that God appointed humankind with dominion over the earth. And as we look at that, it says that we are the earth's overseers, caretakers, people who make the decisions. But the earth has intrinsic value that reflects the character and the beauty of the Creator. And we had closed with that last week, basically saying that we must explore, not exploit. We must enjoy and not worship the earth. So I bring a proposition to you today that says humanity is placed in the middle of the created hierarchy and is uniquely responsible to God, who is above, for the animals, plants, and resources that are below. Keep in mind, I use the word hierarchy. You see, there's establishment. When God created the world, He had called forth the, the land and it popped up out of the water. Let there be light, there was light. There were all these little things. And then God created with His hands and with His breath humankind. And He set them down in the middle of the creation. And He told them to name all the animals. And he said, go, subdue, a little lower than the Creator or the creations. And this is mankind. This is the one whom God has filled with his own breath. But then God told the man to take care of the animals, take care of the plants, take care of the rocks. God gave those things for us to use. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying let's just not do anything with the things in which God has created. We have things like fossil fuels, we have things like uh, titanium, uranium, we have all sorts of things that God has put on this earth for the purpose of use. But we should not be abusing it. If I were to leave something with you, my expectation is that you would take care of it. Many of you know to not leave your valuables with children. Because things that have value, perhaps sentimental value, like pictures that you don't want destroyed, you give that to a little child, you know what they're going to do? They're going to rip it, they're going to color it, they're going to crumple it up, they're going to lose it. Not my child. Mm. It's not that important to them so they're not going to value it as you do. And more often than not, people have become so detached from the earth because we're worried about our nine to five. Where's our money going to come from? We're worried about whether or not in the last rain our house was leaking, how we're going to fix that. We're worried about this, we're worried about that, and we're, we're too busy to worry about whether the runoff goes into the ocean and whether animals are dying or not. Now, there are going to be things that happen 
But God has a way of fixing what is broken. There's been many accounts where lakes have been just too toxic. Things have spilled into it. It was bad. People said nothing is ever going to come from this again. And so people left it alone. And what people thought would take hundreds of years, all of a sudden, in the course of 5, 10, 15 years, these places that were desolate came back with life. After massive wildfires, it just the, the earth is just raised to the ground. All of a sudden, God has a way of seeds going along with birds who drop them, and new life comes out. And what was destroyed comes back. For those of you who are familiar with the sequoias at the National Park, you know that the bark is meant to be fireproof to an extent. And so that what happens is we, as these trees grow up and as the cones drop down, for new ones to grow, the earth needs to be burned around it to kill off all of the foliage so that the new seeds that open up in the heat of the fires can then be planted and then grow and we can have new forestry. For a while, they're like, no, 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 no forest fires. And all of a sudden, things got really dense. And then when the fires happened, it got really immense. So now we have things called controlled burns. We burn things. What? But that could create a fire. Yes, that's literally what burning is. It's a fire. But the purpose is to allow the earth to breathe. We talked about last week how God talked about, he instilled crop rotation into a wandering group of nomads. Remember, the people who were slaves in Egypt, they were now wandering around the wilderness. They weren't farmers. They were builders. They didn't have land in which to cultivate. They maybe had like a little side garden. But they didn't have much else. I think, Doris, you were telling me we, uh, yesterday that you used to grow green beans, right? And after a while, you'd have to weed it, you'd have to wash them, you'd have to clean them, you'd have to do all this stuff. It's easier just to buy them in the store than all the effort you need to do to grow your own. So some of us have our own little gardens, and we, and we like to putter around out there. But in general, people like convenience. And we sometimes forget the earth. Now I'd like us to turn to Psalm chapter 8, if you have it. It's right in the middle of your Bible. You can open it up. Psalm chapter 8. We're going to begin with verse 3. Psalm 8 captures a unique phenomenon in creation. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, the psalmist is trying to do exactly this, this, um, this nature that was designed. It is designed to do what it's supposed to do. We're supposed to ponder the achievements of God. We go outside and we look at something and we're like, wow, that's pretty cool. Going on to verse 4 and 5. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and covered them with glory and honor. It's reminding us of our place. But then continue to look on, and we're going to go to verse 6 and 7, if we notice we have a role in the environment. When he's talking about humans, he says, You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, and the birds that fly in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. This reads like a job description by the Creator to us. Has anybody ever known somebody who had a job? Got, got a couple, got a couple. <laughs> Maybe some of you have a job and you know yourself. Okay? Having a job is something that is common to us. Uh, I did a funeral for a man a little while ago. He was, he was an elderly guy, so he, he wasn't with all of the technique and technology and stuff. He was a machinist, and he was 
pardon the term, but he was a BS. Okay? He came from the east and he moved to the west and he had a job and he went to try to apply for something and he had no idea what to do, but he was good with his hands and anytime he messed up, his supervisor said, that's not right. He said, oh, well, we did it a little different back east. How do you do it over here? He had a quick little phrase, he learned it quick, and he went along as if he had been doing it his whole life. So in his job description, his resume, they, oh, it was lost or what? It, he was able to just get through. It's harder to do some of that now because we check and check and check. There's a lot of redundancies. But many times when you have a job description, it tells you what's expected of you. Now, one of the dangers of job descriptions is that it gives hackers an idea of what your software is. So, for example, if you um, say you need to be proficient in this and you didn't know how to use this, well, that tells the person who a hacker is, well, that's the system they use. Now I just need to know how to break through that. So it's called dumpster diving. Be careful of how much information you put out there because some people will exploit it. But one of the implications of our role is that all living things here have value. But not all living things have equal value. One of my wife's favorite books, <laughs> she knows it is not the case, is Animal Farm by Orson Welles. It's more of a novella than anything else. But these animals take over a farm, and it's quite interesting. And they have these seven principles, and by the end of it, they slowly are moving them away, and they just kind of, the number seven was all animals are equal. They changed that to all animals are equal, some more than others. Now, I don't know how you can be equal and still have a hierarchy, but this is just how they kind of played it. Now, it was a playoff of the Soviet Union and Stalin and Lenin and Marx. It's a great big old thing. But the idea that we're all equal, but some are more equal than others, challenges us. How, how can that be? It can't. But I'm going to say this. All have value in the creation of God, but some have more value than others. Maybe you have done something in your life that you're a little bit prouder than something else. Perhaps you colored a picture and you stayed within the lines. Good job. Perhaps you, you typed something with a typewriter and you didn't have to use the backspace or the little whiteout. Anybody remember a typewriter? My dad was avant-garde. We had a typewriter that you could put a disc in and had a little screen on it. He'd type and type and type and type and type. He'd follow it up. He'd edit right there on the screen. And then he'd hit boop. And all of a sudden the thing would go. Brrr. It's like, Dad, you're the fastest typer ever. No, it was just a little thing that he got when it first was coming out. We should save whales. But not at the expense of people. Sometimes we're so big on saving the whales that we kill the babies. Or sometimes we let the seniors pass a little bit because we're focused on the sloths. We need to make sure we are taking care of people. Take care of the animals. Don't, don't say, I'm not throwing them out. But we have to make understand there is a hierarchy. And people are not equal, but people are more important in the eyes of God than creation. Now God values creation. God cares. Don't just Throw your dogs out on the street and say, good luck. I'm not saying that. I'm saying take care of them. But not at the expense of people. Some of you have family members and you have adopted a cat into your life or a dog into your life and it is your child. Your kid is going hungry, but you spend $5,000 for a surgery for your cat. Some pet things are pretty expensive. And yet your children haven't had new shoes in weeks or years or months or however they often go through shoes. Have you ever had a little kid who grows out of shoes like within weeks? I remember people brought my daughter shoes when she was like six months. I don't know why a six-month-old is going to wear shoes. She's not walking. But anyway, they bought her shoes and she wore them like once. Because she just kept growing. But sometimes we... 
make our family suffer because we have to take care of our animals, which are equal to our children. In fact, some of you value your pets more than your children because your pets don't talk back. Your pets love you no matter what. Your pets eat what you put out in front of them. Children are picky. Children are moody. Children are cats times ten. <laughs> but we should take care of the world. But we have to make sure we understand the priority. The Bible is amazingly balanced. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10 and 11, it's the next book from Psalms if you want to flip over one. But Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10 and 11 tells us this. The righteous care for the needs of the animals. But the kindest act of the wicked are cruel. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. The Bible is clear about the responsibilities and the consequences reflected in how we treat animals and the earth. But we as Christians have been some of the slowest to be responsible in the areas of stewardship of the environment and concern for it. Remember I mentioned a few weeks ago, some people are of the opinion that it's all going to burn anyway. What's the difference? In the name of greed, people will exploit things. How fast can I make money? How quickly can I use up these resources? We have things called clear cutting. We have things where we do strip mining. We just go and destroy the earth because we want to make a quick buck. That's a problem. But we also put people in concentration camps. We put people in segregated areas. We put people in standards that are less than suitable because it might interfere with our bottom line. <clears throat> we need to make sure we are taking care of people. If you remember, one of the teachers of the law came to Jesus with a test, and he said, what is the greatest commandment? And God said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophet can be summed up in these two commandments. And the man said, wow, Jesus, you have spoken right. Good job. And then he shut up and left him alone, realizing he couldn't trick him. All the Bible is summed up with these two rules. Love God with your everything and treat people the way you want to be treated. But that is hard because some other people don't treat you the way you want to be treated. Other people are not following those two rules. And yet God is asking us to do that to the world. And that is a challenge. And I don't have an easy answer for you because I don't know all of your circumstances. But God's word is very clear. You should be productive. You should take things out of the ground wisely. There's energy to be had. And that's why I put it there. But our track record has not done well. The Bible has quite a lot to say about our role as taking care of the earth. God himself honors the efforts of people who make time to treat his creation with responsibility. And the experts say it would take years to fix things. Yet God, as I mentioned earlier, has a way to fix things earlier. And if we focus on helping God instead of hindering God, starting with people. Anybody remember a Hurricane Katrina a little while ago? Anybody remember that thing? That was a devastating piece in our, our, our society. People lost their homes, people lost their lives. There were some oil spills that happened as a result out in that area. Anybody remember the Gulf of Mexico oil spill? 
massive area. I mean, people were basically saying that area is going to be just done. And yet, God has these creatures like sea cucumbers that can suck up the pollution and create life. God has put things here on this earth that can help make, make amends for our mess-ups. And all of a sudden, that gulf area is becoming more and more and more inhabitable. Because God knows how to fix His problems. We try to exacerbate them a few times. And that's why I'd like us to close with this biblical implication. Psalms 8, 3 through 8. We are to use, not abuse, the animals, plants, and resources, all for the glory of God. What are you doing in your life to point people to God? What resources do you have at your disposal that you can point people to God? It is not your job to defend God. It is not your job to try to promote God in a way that is more than you can handle. No. Point people to God and let God handle. He can argue. He's fine. He's got his word. God can handle that stuff. But your life should not push people away but it should draw them in. And how you take care of the world can demonstrate what you value. Because remember, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we say thank you for giving us a world. Thank you for giving us creation. Thank you for putting us in the middle of it to take care of it for such a massive responsibility. But God, as you, you use us, help us not to abuse the gifts in which you have given us. But Lord, may we remember to worship the Creator, you, and not the creation. Give people strength this week so that they might love their neighbors. Give people strength this week so that they might love you with their everything. Bless us, O oh God, as we move forth from this place. Give us a special filling of your spirit. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gifts and the givers. I ask that you would bless both. May this church's doors remain open as long as we have a purpose in this community. And I thank you for the faithfulness of the people who are gathered here today, who support us online, and who are present in this community and value our ministry. Help us to continue to be present here for you. Regardless of what goes on in the world around us, may we be present for you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're invited to rise as we close in the doxology in the Lord's Prayer. Christ comes again. Amen. Amen.